church is with what is going on in the center. Um, it's about cities. And particularly, I think that a lot of what we're trying to achieve in terms of sustainability and livability, we're going to be able to do by revitalizing our cities. Cities like New London, which have, over the last few um, years, I've been able to spend some time here, and um, I've really grown to appreciate the charms of, of being in New London. Um, so what I'm going to talk today about is some strands of research that we've been um, carrying out. And one set relates to the fate of different cities. Um, and in particular, cities that have actually been able to maintain their character. So unlike cities like Hartford or New London, to a lesser extent, or New Haven, there are cities in the U.S. and in other places in the world that have actually been able to withstand the, um, the assault of the last 50 years and have maintained their character, maintained their wealth, and maintained their health. And I really want to focus on that issue of health and wealth as smart growth, as sustainability issue. It's not just about the environment but it's also about how we pay for transportation, how we pay for the places we live. And what we're finding in our research is that the things that we do to maintain the environment are the same things that we do to safeguard our pocketbooks and also our quality of life. So um, that's the focus. And I want to really start off by going back to um, Kingston, Jamaica. This is the city I grew up in. This is the street I grew up on. This is the street I learned to learn to love cities. And in 2004, I was in Kingston uh, for Fulbright. I lived there for about four months. And for the first three months, I didn't have a car. And coming from the perspective of a, an engineer, it was really an eye-opening experience because intellectually, I cotton on to the idea that transportation did have social and economic impact. But living in Kingston without a car was really a, 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 an experience. What I found was that when I lived in Kingston without a car, I was part of a very different economy from that which I would later take part in when I had a car. I shopped in different places. I um, went to different places. I supported a different part of the economy. I, in fact, I supported the local economy. I think this picture here of this gentleman on King Street really illustrates the point. This um, is how a lot of people um, get by in Kingston, um, be part of the economy. But this is what we consider to be the fashionable street in Kingston. I mean, this is an astounding thing to say, but this is the truth. Um, and the difference between downtown Kingston, where, we were, where you, you're able to get by with non-motorized transportation, and uptown, um, it's, it, it's just mirrored. It's, and um, it it's really, again, illustrates this issue of differences in terms of what transportation supports. I mean, in halfway tree, there is no way that a man with a push cart would survive. So, we, again, it's about supporting a different kind of economy. And when you think about Jamaica, think about a place that doesn't have any oil, we don't make cars, most people can't afford cars, and yet the pattern is to develop in a way that supports people in car. The pattern is to develop in ways that does not allow people to um, get around, go about their business if they don't have a car. So when you talk about smart growth, this is exactly the opposite of that. And I, I just want to make the point that what we're talking about here is not something that is unique to America. I like to use this Jamaican example because it really shows just how crazy some of these patterns that we're seeing are. Um, the, I was recently reading about um, people getting killed in Jamaica, pedestrians, 
And this just shows the kind of environment that we have created. Again, this is a fashionable part of Kingston. Um, recently, the uh, government got a huge amount of monies from the, the French um, government to build a toll road. And as you can see here, this is, this is actually, to put, give you context, the toll road linking the two largest cities in Jamaica, the city of Kingston to the city of Portmore. And you can see all the types of things that are not allowed. <laughs> and that's not, that sign is not saying no one-footed people are allowed, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> but in a country, again, where maybe 20% of the population have cars, there is no way for people to get from Kingston to Portmore legally by bicycle, on foot, by a horse-drawn cart, or by a push cart. I was speaking with your director here and he was telling me that basically it's the exact same thing in the city, trying to go from Groton to New London. Okay. So we have created the system and then we tell ourselves all these fairy tales that people love cars. And what I'm finding in my research is that we don't love cars that much. Um, one of the things that happens in Jamaica, and probably does here also, is that if you tell people not to do things that don't, but if you tell people things that don't make sense, they just ignore you. And this is what you see happening there. People have to get around, and, and they're going to find ways of doing it. So, um, that brings me to the point that a point that has really influenced a lot of my research and a lot of my um, thinking about transportation over the last few years uh, is, are these words by Lewis Mumford that he wrote around 19, 1959. And he really asked this question. He said that engineers, and he was speaking on engineers, engineers do, do not ever ask themselves the question, what is transportation? And I go into classes and I ask that question, what is transportation for? And of course, people, the response is transportation is to get from point A to point B. And what Mumford was trying to get across was that that was not the case. That was not what was the essence of transportation. He said that a good transportation system minimizes unnecessary transportation which sounds like a paradox, right? But really what he was trying to get at is that we don't travel for just traveling sake. We travel to do things. We travel to be with friends. We travel to get goods, etc., etc. And if you think of transportation as just traveling, we end up with the transportation system, with the land use, that we have in this country, that we have in Jamaica, that we have in so much of the world. Mumford pointed out that uh, the purpose of transportation is to bring people and goods to places where they're needed, to concentrate the greatest variety of goods and people within a limited area in order to widen the possibility of choice without making it necessary to travel. So for me, that's about transportation, but that's also the definition of what we should be seeking if we're talking about smart growth. Um, I, I, was, I gave this presentation, or part of this presentation last week at Manchester Community College, and I thought to illustrate this idea of what Mumford was trying to get across. This is the city of Washington, D.C., a functioning city. It might not have been so functioning 10 years ago. And this shows the distribution of pharmacies in that city. And this is our capital city, um, Hartford, Connecticut, with a distribution of pharm uh, pharmacies at the same scale. And just ask yourself the question, how do people get around in these two cities? And that's really the essence of what transportation is about, of what smart growth is about. The president, who lives at the bottom part of that picture in the middle, he has three pharmacies to choose from. So he can walk to any of those pharmacies if he chooses. Um, our governor would have to get in his car to get to the pharmacy. 
And that's the essence of smart growth. That's the essence of the role of transportation in smart growth. Um, so what happened? Where did we go off the rail? Hartford was not always like that. So what I would like to do um, to start this presentation is to look at some of the things that have changed. Because I really believe if we're going to address the issue of smart growth going forward, we need to also understand what happened over the last hundred or so years. So this story really starts, the current the dilemma that we are in really started around the year 1909. The car was invented around 1888. Um, only rich people had cars, and we had things like um, a flagman had to go before the car in the early days. So it was a very different environment. In 1909, everything changed with the um, Mr. Ford's assembly line. And you can see um, the history, that hundred year history of what happened in the US after the coming of the, um, the, the Model T. Um, and I'm just going to highlight some of the points certainly that um, Professor Hayden talked about this morning, but you can see it from a um, quantitative point of view just how much the country has changed in the last 100 years. So we had the Model T in, um, I can't see my own slides, <laughs> in 1908 or so. We had the Depression, which was a, just a small bump in the road. World War II, um, the, the Housing Act, which uh, was referenced to this morning, the highway bill, the Interstate Highway Bill of 1956, and then two major bumps. 1973, the first oil crisis. 1979, the second oil crisis. This is what I'm actually interested in, and this is what I think we need to be paying some attention to, is what is going on now? Why is um, the, the miles driven De decreasing. Any any ideas from the audience? What's going on? What is that? I think it's fear of terrorism. Fear of terrorism. Okay, I haven't heard that one, but maybe you're right. You mean that they're driving less for because of that? Yes. What is that? Oil prices spiked. Actually, this, the turndown started before the oil prices started, so that's kind of interesting. Economic downturn. The economic, the um, downtown started long before any economic downtown. Down, downturn, yes. An inconvenient truth? <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe he had that much power, I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, traffic. But, traffic. <laughs> what seems to be happening is that there is a change in culture. And there are lots of evidence to support this. Um, a student of mine that now lives in, the, um, in Germany, um, works for BMW, recently completed a study, and what they're finding is that young people are driving less in many industrialized countries. They're buying cars at a later age, and they're driving less. And some, there's some evidence that the same thing is happening in America. So, the, yes sir? Is it because of changing demographics for younger some of that is what is happening, yes. I, I bring it up because it really is suggesting that we are going into a different era. But I'll get back to that later. So what I wanted to do is to start with is to look at what was going on before 1950. If we had continued at that rate, we would be driving an awful lot, 1.5 trillion miles. But something happened, we didn't continue at that rate. And this might seem like pie in the sky, but using that rate, this is where we are, actually. This is where Canada is. This is where Germany is. This is where Japan is. So it's not really impossible that we could have maintained 
a more moderate rate, something radically changed in this country. And just think about the implication if we had continued at that rate. Think about the implication for our cities, for New London. Think about the implication for oil import. Think about the uh, implication for the amount of money we spend on highways. All of that would have been different. We're not going back there, but I think it's a useful thing to think of. Um, this is where we are. And you can see after 1950, after the world, after world War II, or starting around 1948, the, the rate just ratcheted up. So the question really is, that I've, I'm, I'm going to try to look at to start with is what happened? Why did auto use explode after World War II? And to show the extent that it exploded, in 1946, the average American drove six miles every day. By 2004, when we peaked, the average American drove 30 miles per day. And you think about that number, there's an average for every single man, woman, child in the country. Okay. So, again, do we love our cars that much? I don't think so. This was something that was created. And part of the creation was a change in our attitudes to how we lived in cities, to the type of cities we had, just, just a sense that in the 30s and 40s, we had just invent, we had seen the car, we had seen lots of changes, and there was a sense that we were moving into a different era. And this is um, probably reflective of the statement of that period. The cities will be part of the country. I shall live 30 miles from my office in one direction, on the pine tree. My secretary will live 30 miles in the other direction. I don't have one. <laughs> So you might, <laughs> from um, away in the other direction, and she also is going to have her own pantry. We, we shall both have our own car. We shall wear up tires. We shall use up tires, wear out road surfaces, and gears, and consume oil and gasoline. And uh, we talk about sustainability now. Um, this is like the anti-sustainability vision for the future all of which will necessitate a great deal of work, enough for all. Why would this vision sell? <laughs> Why would this vision sell? What was attractive about this vision? Well, of course, the answer was, it was 1935. <laughs> and what was important was, was jobs. So that was part of why this vision sell. I wish I had a better picture of this architect, but that's the best one I could find. He doesn't look very happy about his vision of the future. <laughs> this is also his vision for Paris. This is what he suggested that was needed for the city of Paris to level the center of Paris and to build these towers in the park. And you think this is crazy. This is not what a city like Paris should strive for. And of course, Paris did not go for this except on their outskirts. Um, this is the same vision, and this is a vision for the city of London. And again, London mostly did not go for this vision. But some people did. Um, back to Kingston, I remember in um, 1969, I woke up um, and I got to school and I read the newspaper and there was this vision for a new Kingston waterfront. And it was basically the modernist city. This exact vision of the modernist city was being touted and being um, a kid in a poor country, this sounded like an incredible vision of the future that we should all embrace. And in Kingston, we actually did it. We built the modernist city on the waterfront. We leveled the waterfront of Kingston and built this place. I was here two years ago with um, Enrique Penelos, uh, the Bogota mayor, 
And um, he was lamenting the fact that we have basically turned our back to the waterfront. We have this beautiful harbor that nobody hangs out. Instead, the crumbling King Street is where you find people. You don't find them on the waterfront in Kingston. Hartford, Connecticut. Many of you, any of you know Hartford? Recognize it? Recognize the city? <laughs> the city is gone. This is what we replaced it with. So that vision of the modernist city was what seduced places like Hartford, New Haven. It seduced places like Waterbury. They leveled the center of Waterbury. They just didn't build anything. But they, they had the vision that this is where they were going. Um, the idea was the pedestrians and the cars. We had to make way for the cars. The cars had to be separated. They had to be given their own way into the city. And the pedestrians had to be separated. If you, any of you know this place, you know that this is a windswept desert that nobody wants to be. And much of our capital city is like that now. So, um, how we conceived of how cities should be built changed. And that was a big part of the change. But there were other changes. How we conceived of streets in cities changed. We no longer built King Street in America or in Jamaica. Instead, we built Brighton Parkway. This is the new town in Jamaica. And you notice the pattern. I could have taken this picture in Orlando or even in Storrs, Connecticut, the exact same pattern. This is the street by the, by the town hall in the town that I live. Okay. So the idea that um, Mr. Lecoubertier said we should kill the street, and basically that's what we did. That's another element of this. We also decided that grids and connected streets were no longer appropriate. That we needed to get away from building gridded streets. And a big agency, I've done a lot of research on this recently, uh, over the last five years, looking at safety, looking at stuff like uh, mode share, etc. The big agency in bringing about this change is actually very surprising. It was the Federal Housing Authority. It was the engineers, it was the planners, it was the Federal Housing Authority that put out pamphlets that said that this kind of pattern was not what we should be building. So we ended up building this. Where is this? Who cares? <laughs> it's everywhere. <laughs> this is what we build now. This is what our codes tell us to build. And over time, the engineers learned to develop a code that supported the vision of the Federal Housing Authority. Um, so Hartford, Connecticut, the, again, that's out in the suburb. So what happened in the cities? In Hartford, Connecticut, we had a grid. We had a dense mixture of land use. We had the connected streets. We had nice urban streets. What did we do? Not only that we removed buildings, we actually amputated a large portion of the city. If you do an aerial, this is 1960, if you look at an aerial of Hartford, Connecticut, it doesn't look much different from this. It has not changed in 50 years. So we went from a 1930s pattern, overnight we created this. And then we say, what is wrong with Hartford? What is wrong with Hartford was that it basically, a large portion of it was destroyed. Um, one of my students has been doing a project where we're looking at parking. We're actually measuring parking in cities around the country. 1957, this is what the pattern in Hartford, Connecticut looked like. There were 15,000 spaces. Most of them were surface spaces. 2,000 were in garages, the dark. Um, two dark spots there were garages. By 2000, this is what downtown Hartford looked like. 45,000 spaces, an increase of three times. And you would ask yourself, why? More jobs, 
jobs decrease. More people, population in Hartford decreased by 50%. More retail, G Fox is gone, Sage Allen is gone, there is no retail in Hartford. So why did we need to increase parking by three times? So that has been the subject of a research that we have been conducting which we call the land consumption um, uh, research. And so far, one of my students is here that has been doing this work. Uh, we've been looking at measuring the amount of parking and transportation related uses in different cities. And so far we're up to these 10 cities. Three of them are what I would call low auto use cities. And the rest are high auto use cities. And this study actually started because one of these cities, Cambridge, Mass, was, a, was one city that we noticed actually have less people driving now than in 1960, which is so outside the realm of what is going on in other cities that this really was an eye opener for us. So, what's, so, what's, so this is what we have found. Um, this is just one of the, um, the sketches, the, um, the plots that we found. So the rate of driving versus parking per activity. And we define activity as either somebody living in the city or somebody working in the city. So the amount of um, parking increases from around 0.2 spaces per activity to around 1.1 space per activity in the high driving cities. A huge difference um, in these American cities. Um, this shows parking per activity versus activity per square mile. And I think this is a really telling um, um, in data. And just to illustrate what's going on, so in one city, in um, the city at the bottom, at the top there, they're allowed, they're able to get by with a quarter parking space per activity. The other cities, many of the other cities need up to four times more parking per activity. So the question is, how can that be? And what's going on with these cities? How can cities function so differently? What's going on here? Um, this is what we think is going on. A lot of the cities use what I would call conventional transportation planning, which came out of the 1950s. The idea of conventional um, transportation planning is that cities are going to grow. That growth is going to lead to more people. So the assumption that is made is that that means more auto travel which in turn means that we need to provide more facility, more streets, wider streets, more parking. This is the basic of all transportation planning now, or most transportation planning, convention. There are some things, however, that are, are forgotten here. One of the things that is forgotten is that there is also this feedback loop that the more auto facilities you make, is the more people are going to travel by auto. Okay. And that never gets factored into the equation. So what we have built up is what I call a spiral of decay. So basically, by creating this um, downward spiral, what we actually do is we end up with fewer buildings in the cities because all of that auto facilities take space we end up with fewer buildings, we end up with fewer people. So it's a spiral that we see playing out in Hartford, in New London, in, um, in Detroit. If you want to see the prime example, go and look at Detroit, Michigan, Columbus, Ohio. <laughs> what is going on in some of the other cities that seem to have about this trend, the Cambridges of the world, for example, they have a totally different approach. In these places, what they start with is not a question about how many cars can we accommodate, 
but I start with a different question is what do we want our city to look like? They start with that question and then they say we're going to create a transportation system that will give us that kind of city. It's a totally different approach. It does not, it's not based on the idea that transportation, there's a, a, such a thing as transportation demand. There is no such thing as transportation demand. Transportation is a derived demand. You create transportation demand by the type of place you build. How do we know that this is what is going on? Well, let's look at two examples. The first example, Cambridge, Massachusetts, which is basically probably the best example of a city in America that is not following the conventional approach to transportation. The second example, Hartford, Connecticut, which is the poster child for conventional planning. So um, let's start with facilities for driving, highway expansions. This is what was proposed for Hartford, Connecticut in, 19, in the 50s and 60s. This is what was actually built. So Hartford was very successful. It, had, it succeeded in building most of the freeways. I particularly love that um, piece that ended up not actually going through Bushnell Park. The idea that you would put an, a freeway through Bushnell Park is just so astounding. They didn't do it. <laughs> this is Cambridge, Massachusetts. This is what was planned, and this is what was built. <laughs> what was planned and what was built. And it's like Cambridge served as kind of a repellent magnet that there was no way that you were going to put a freeway in our city. Can I ask a good question? Yes. The interesting thing is that Cambridge is a true republic in our country. Hartford is not a republic. Cambridge has a manifestation of self-governance. Yes. And I agree with you totally, but I'm not talking about whether or not Hartford would have been able to do this. What I'm more interested in is the outcome. And the outcome is demonstrably different. In, um, in 1960, Hartford and Cambridge had exactly the same per capita income. And you, you must be surprised to hear that because th that would, it's totally different now. In 1960, they had the same amount of cars per capita. They still have the same amount of cars. The difference is people don't use the cars to get around Cambridge. They use it to go out into the country. So it's a very different, you're right. It's not about the politics so much as looking at the result. This, I think, is the most insidious issue in cities. So we focus on the highways and policies related to highways, but the most insidious thing that any city does is the parking policy. What do you do about parking? Most cities behave as if they're suburbs, and they say we have to have a certain number of parking most cities say we need four spaces per hundred, per thousand square foot of office, of anything. And this is a really major destructive force in city. You can see how it destroyed Hartford. Um, I got this example. This is a very extreme case, but it really illustrates the point. It talks about just last year, a developer proposed rehabilitating a, an abandoned building, turning it into apartments. Indianapolis, the city zoning code required one parking space per um, apartment. So um, we have to have this number or more. Um, 
To do that, they would have needed to find surface parking. There was no space on the lot. Um, the developers asked for variance. Um, part of the issue was that the, the, um, the property was surrounded by lots of parking. I've been to Indianapolis, and it's almost all parking. Um, it had three um, bus um, routes running, and yet the city was insistent. The, the city planners pointed out that the only way you were going to get the amount of parking is to demolish part of the building. So this is a huge problem for cities. This is an extreme case, but this is what happens in cities all over the country. Um, the difference in Cambridge, in 1981, Cambridge implemented what is known as a parking cap. So instead of saying that we need a certain minimum amount of parking, they said to the developers, you can only build a certain amount of parking, a small number of parking. So it totally flips the issue on its head. It's saying that if you're going to come to our city, this is not a city where you're going to be able to have the kind of car access that you have out in the suburbs. So it's about the character of the city rather than about accommodating people to be able to drive into the city. Um, so, what's going on? So we, are, we had this automobile era, and we have lots of places still behaving as if they're in this automobile era. We have places now, I think part of what is going on now is that we have places that are beginning to realize the automobile era is over. It's over because it doesn't work for cities. New York City is not growing. It has not grown by a million people over the last 20 years because it is behaving like a suburb. Chicago is not growing yet, but downtown Chicago has started to realize that it needs to behave like a city. Portland, Oregon, Washington, D.C. The era is over. It's over because we can't afford gas. It's over because people can't afford the cost of transportation. And we still have cities that have not caught on to that idea yet. However, as we move forward, I think there are cities we can learn from. Cambridge, we can learn from. Another city we can learn from, well, my favorite city, I'm going to be here for my next sabbatical, Zurich, um, Switzerland. This city is a city that started a city-friendly approach to transportation back in the 1960s. People voted against a subway. We don't want a subway. That's not the type of city we want. We want our streetcars because that will be with the character of our city. That will provide the access we need. Um, one of my students reminded me, did a project this year about um, Zurich, and he pointed out, he pointed out that this is a city where people like the finer things of life. They like the, um, the chocolate, the Luxembourgerly from Sprungly, they like um, great watches, and yet this is a city with the highest rate of transit use of any city in Europe. How is that possible? Well, if you look carefully in this picture, in the background, you can see the streetcars. I remember once reading where part of the plan for the streetcar was it should appear in every single picture that you take of Zurich. And they succeeded with this picture. But I've been going to um, for Switzerland for a while. Um, a few years ago, my friend Peter visited from Switzerland. This was during the spike when we went up to $5 gas. And I said to Peter, we were on a um, Hartford bus, I said, what is the cost of gas in, um, in, in Bern? And he was like, I was shocked at his response. Any guesses? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know and I don't care. And then he took, out, he took out his wallet and he said, this is how I get around in Switzerland. I pay 3,000 francs for this and I can use the streetcar, the ferries, da 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 da, the national trains, I can go anywhere for 3,000. If I want to go first class, I pay a supplement. So last summer I was in Switzerland I decided to try out the iron ticket for Alice, one ticket for all, and these are <laughs> my, um, what is that little, 
the travel velocity um, norm, that's my, <laughs> my version, on the, um, the commuter rail, the polyband to the university, to the Utleberg train, the ferry, and the streetcars. So, you know, it's a, it's a different approach to transportation. It's an it's a approach to transportation that works with how people want to live. This is um, a new in, in, innovation, in, in, um, innovation where on every single type of vehicles, bus, trams, ferries, you're given the map of the next stops, the next four stops, how long it's going to take, how do you connect, what trains you're going to connect to, what buses, etc. And again, I mean, we have the technology now that a lot of the freedom that we talk about with cars are much more possible with, with transit um, now. One night, I was walking through the, the, the train station, which is basically the center of life in Zurich, and people were setting up around this big dance floor. And it was the night for the, um, the, the Viennese waltz night in, 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 um, in Zurich, and people were getting dressed to the nines and waltzing in the train station. So um, it's just a different image, it's just a different vision, and I think it's a vision that we're going to learn, need to learn how to get on board with as we talk about smart growth, livability, and sustainability. Thank you for your attention.